introduce this person coming up to minister today. We have a long past and a great future together. He's my dear friend, Pastor Tony Samuels. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. How y'all doing this fine Sunday morning? Are you happy to be in the house of God? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's get out those Bibles, those Bibles with pages, <laughs> wood. Amen. And let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Bishop and Pastor Allison for the awesome opportunity to come and minister to the church this morning. I consider it a privilege and a very high honor to minister at this great church. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter four. And let's take a look at verse number 29. Verse number 29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you this morning for the awesome opportunity to minister your word. And Father God, I ask right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that you will give me the words of wisdom the words of knowledge, the words of understanding. Father God, that you will give me utterance to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would have me to speak. Father, I pray right now that you will use this word to speak into people's lives, to speak into people's situations, to speak into their circumstances. Father God, I pray that this body will be edified, built up, strengthened, refreshed, and revived like never before. Father God, let your fire fall in this place. Father God, we need you more than ever. We need your strength. We need your power, Lord. We can't do anything without you. And, Lord, we just call on you this morning to manifest yourself in our midst. Father, we thank you for it now in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, say amen. 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 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You know, Bishop's been ministering about going back to the basics, going back to the foundations. And, and as I was um, preparing to, to, to ask the Lord, you know, what will you have me to minister? I began to meditate on foundational things. And, and, and the foundation, a lot of the foundational things for me was some of those first revelations that God gave to me as a born-again Christian. Some of the first things when I, that I began to hear as a Christian where the Holy Spirit began to direct me and lead me in his word to begin to illuminate me and enlighten me in areas where I did not have understanding or where I did not have a revelation. And one of the first areas that the Lord began to minister to me as a Christian right here at the Lighthouse as a student in the Faith Home Ministries back in 1996 was about communication. And the power of words and the way that you communicate words. Now, listen, before coming to God, I had no understanding that words carry so much weight in the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of darkness. But when God began to give me an understanding, he showed me that a lot of things that were happening in my life, I was initiating them with the very words that I was speaking on a daily basis. So one of the things that God began to lead me in the word, and this is one of the first scriptures that he led me to, was let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And listen, one of the, the, and you know what that word grace means? It means the favor of almighty God is ministered through the words that we speak and we declare. Listen, not only minister to others, but minister back into my own life the words that I speak on a constant and a daily basis. You know, I know some people have gone to the extreme with this revelation, but listen, just because people have gone and abused the revelation of God does not mean that we're supposed to throw the truth of the word of God out the window. Listen, just because somebody takes a car 
and thinks they can fly and drive it off of a bridge don't mean you're going to stop driving your car. You're going to continue to drive it. Amen? Just because somebody abused it. And sometimes when we talk about the power of words, some people back up because so many people are trying to uh, name and claim uh, uh, things that are outside of the word of God. And they, they begin to cringe at that revelation. But listen, as you begin to look at the word of God, it's a solid foundation truth in the word of God that he wants his children to be enlightening, illuminate him, and not have the law work against you, but have the law work for you. Now, through the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has given us the victory in every situation and every circumstance in this life. You know, when we talk about Satan or the devil or the enemy, I want you to know right now that he is a defeated foe. Listen, I never want you to, 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 to magnify the enemy so much in your life. Listen, somebody that's already been defeated by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through what Jesus Christ did, he took the keys of death from the enemy. He took that out of his hand. You don't have to fear death of anything, death of relationships, uh, death of finances, death of, of in the physical realm. You don't have to fear because Jesus already took the keys of death back from the enemy. But listen, he's an enemy that still is looking for access into our lives, and he's banking on your ignorance and how many know that ignorance is almost a form of darkness because ignorance is, is the absence of knowledge that you don't have. And he comes in those areas of our life where we don't have knowledge and there's ignorance and there's darkness there. And those are the very areas of our lives that he comes in and tries to gas, gain access back into our lives once again. He's looking for, he's on the outskirts of our life looking for a cracked door. Or maybe a window that you left open in your life. The Bible tells us to give him no place. Now, I said that Jesus took the keys of death. But listen, in Proverbs 18.21, it says this familiar scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Even though Jesus took the keys of death, Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Amen. So, wait a minute. Don't you think that the enemy knows that scripture? Matter of fact, listen, let me tell you something. The enemy knows the Bible more than us, better than us. He knows it from Genesis to Revelation. And sometimes he'll use your ignorance to the word of God to, use, to work the word, to work his kingdom against you, even though you are a resident of the kingdom of God. So he knows that the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So listen, one of the ways he's going to try to get death back into your life is through the words that you speak on a daily basis. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And then he goes, hmm, so wait a minute. I need them to cooperate with what I'm doing in their lives and get them to begin to speak death, and then I can keep my plan going, even though Jesus gave them the victory. Some people think that words are insignificant. This is not true. One of the biggest deceptions is people think that their words are insignificant. Listen, but they are very significant in the life of the believer. Words can make the deal or break the deal. Everything you see in the natural realm was created by the spoken word of the living God. Notice I said not just words on a paper or in a book, but God actually spoke his word, and created everything that you see in existence with the spoken word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Anything that God starts with is going to start with his word. Listen, anything that's going to start in your life from the kingdom of God is going to start with the word of God. 
Listen, I know sometimes we pray these general prayers. That's good, but it's time to get the scripture and listen, get that word down on the inside of us and make a demand on that word because the word is the starting point for the manifestation of the power and the glory of God in your life. It starts with the word. What word are you standing on? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, to come into existence, to arise, to originate. God uses his spoken word to, to bring the things that we see into existence. Now jump over to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Let the preacher get a breather. Man, he was just telling us to screw. Why he's having us go to that one to get a breather? Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, look at verse 3. It says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do a pair. So listen, it says that the word of God, the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things were seen were not made of things which do appear. What are the things that don't appear? Words. You can't see them, but God is trying to show us that words will materialize in this natural realm and produce something that you can touch and it feel, something that you can see. But it all started and originated with something you can't see, which is words. Words, even right now, that I'm speaking into the atmosphere cannot be seen, but it's making a faith deposit into your spiritual bank account to produce the outcome that God wants to see happen in your life. Words are significant. Now, I said that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I looked up that word frame. It says a border or a case for enclosing, a rigid structure used as a major support in building or engineering. So basically, God uses word as a border, as a case for enclosing this whole world, this whole planet. The word of God is holding everything together. You take the word out and everything falls apart. That's why God said heaven and earth will pass away before my word. Listen, we'll, 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 we'll come up void and nonproductive. Because basically saying my word is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is found not, not, not uh, uh, in, integrity in that word, everything else will fall apart because the word is holding it all together. So the world as we see was not always like this. Matter of fact, in Genesis in the beginning, the world was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light and so on. God's word put things in order and made this planet a place that could be inhabited. Now tell me something. If it worked for the planet, imagine what it could do in your life, in my life. That's why a life without the word falls apart. When you take the word of God out of your life, your life begins to fall apart at the seams because the word is the very thing that's holding it together. You know, I talked to some people that stop coming to church, stop getting in the word. And listen, the byproduct of that is a life that begins to fall apart. I'm like, listen, it's a byproduct of you removing the word of God out of your life. That's why the marriage is falling apart. That's why the finances are falling apart. That's why you're losing the job. That's why all this stuff is happening because you took out the key ingredient, the main component, which is the word of God. And that's why everything else is falling apart because you took the word of God out. So listen, that's why I got to keep coming to church. That's why I got to keep hearing the word of God. That's why I got to keep studying the word of God because it's the very thing that's holding everything together. And I don't want my, I don't know about you, but I don't want my life to fall apart again. It wasn't until the word of God 
When I came here as a student in the faith home and the word of God, and I started sitting under the teaching of the word of God, and all of, and every day I stayed, light became began to come into my life. I began to be illuminated, and all of a sudden the word of God began to expose every area that the enemy was trying to attack in my life. My brothers in the, in the faith home, that's why the enemy attacks you to get out of the word of God, get out of the covering, because the more you stay under the word of God, the more light comes, the more illumination comes, and he can't hide. Listen, where there's light, he's looking for a dark place in your life, and the longer you stay, the more illumination of the word, listen, makes his place in your life smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually he has no place in your life. Give him no place. So you got to stay under this word. Listen, uh, uh, the Bible says when the sower sows the word, immediately Satan comes to take the word, to snatch the word. Listen, it's not about the offense. It's not about the thing that got you mad and upset. It's about the word. Your word is on the line. He wants the word out of your life. If he can get the word out of your life, you have no fruit. He's after the word of God in our lives. He wants to take that word. He wants you to stop sitting up under the word. He doesn't want you to sit up under teaching. He don't want you to be obedient to the word of God. So listen, stay in the word. Jesus said in Matthew, in John 6, 63, Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. Jesus, Jesus, the word knew that everything that was in the physical was a manifestation of the spiritual. If it was going to change in the natural, he had to change it first in the spiritual. And his words were the tools that he used to fix what was out of place, whether it was casting out devils or healing someone. Jesus used his words as containers to manifest the blessing of God. He used the word, if I can speak, be healed. Hear, be healed of this plague, be delivered from these bondages. He used his word to deliver and set the captives free, the word of God. So now let me go back to that because I think I went over that part kind of quick. I said that Jesus, the word, knew that everything that was in the physical was a manifestation of the spiritual And if it was going to change in the natural, he had to change it first in the spiritual. And then he said that my words are spirit and life. My words are spirit and life. Basically saying what Jesus was saying was that the word, when he spoke the word, it would go back into into the spirit realm. And it would deal with with the root cause of what was happening in the natural realm. See, sometimes we're just trying to put a Band-Aid on the outside thing and we're not dealing with the root cause. And even though you may chop a weed down, if you don't get it up by the root, that weed will once again return back in your life because you have not dealt with the root of that thing. And when you begin to deal with the word of God, God's word begins to deal with the root of that issue. Listen, to reverse it, to change it, to bring a new manifestation, a new root system to manifest the outcome of Almighty God. Now, we know the story about the fig tree. Basically, Jesus said to that fig tree, because it wasn't producing that no man eat eat of this tree forever. It's done. Then they walked. Nothing happened. Then they left, and I think it was a 24-hour miracle. They came back the next day, and the thing was shriveled up and dried up. What was it? Jesus' word was not just dealing with the fig leaves. Jesus' word began to deal with the root of that tree and began to go in and, listen, take the very life out of that root to, listen, what was done in the in underground that you can't see eventually materialized into the very thing that you do see. And listen, when I'm talking about words and when I'm talking about declaring the word of God, do not be dismayed that you do not see anything changing in the natural. 
Because a lot of time, don't worry about the natural. The natural is a result of what's going on underground in the root system. And the word of God is designed to go and deal with the root system. Just give it time. Give it a minute. Give it a moment. Go get a cup of iced tea. Listen, just go watch a movie or something and come back and you will see the results of the word of God in your life. They were like, Master, look at the fig tree that you cursed. And then he went into the whole teaching of speaking to mountains. We're gonna, we'll get to that in a minute. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says, I call heaven and earth the record to stay against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. You choose life by right choices, by making right choices according to the word of God. Every time you do that, you're choosing life. But also you choose life by choosing right words because life and death are in the power of the tongue. So when I choose to speak words of life, I'm choosing life. I'm choosing the blessing. Listen, even though everything on the natural may be contradicting what I'm believing for, I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm going to hold my peace. I'm not going to get in disagreement with the word of God. But, but it don't look good for you. Don't matter. I'm not, I'm not going to assist the devil in my life. I'm not going to be a part of the problem. I'm going to be a part of the solution in my life. And I'm not going to speak anything that's contrary to the word of God. No matter how it looks, no matter how it feels. Feels, no matter how it comes, no matter what they say, I'm sticking, holding fast to the word of almighty God. I may be shaking, I may be, be looking like I'm out of it, but it don't matter. I'm holding on to the word of the living God because it's my only way out of this situation. God uses his word as creative force to create the world and universe. The question this morning is, what world are you creating for yourself with the words of your mouth? Now, let's go to Psalms chapter 34. You've been saying that for I ain't seen nothing. Don't worry about it. He's coming. Do you know that Abraham had to wait 25 years for Isaac? Joshua had to wait 40 years to go into the promised land? Okay, Psalms 34, let's look at verse number 12. Listen to this. What man is he that desired life? And loveth many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Now listen, it's not just about just speaking a bunch of right words. It's about living right too. You can't be speaking words and then living opposite of the word of God. You know, you open it, uh, all right, I got close the door over here, but you got the door open. You close the front door, but the back door is still open. You can't be living crazy, declaring the word of God and living sloppy. You got to close all the doors. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So it goes together. So depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Now listen, in those scriptures it says, Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Then it goes in verse 13, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. There is a connection to what you say and what you see in your life. You only want to speak what you desire. You don't want to speak what you don't desire, but I just tell it how it is. But what if you don't like how it is? Are you just going to live with how it is? I don't want to live with how it is. I want to change what is to what's already been done. I don't want to live with what with, with, with is when God's given us the power to change what is. Now go to Luke chapter 1. Ah, words can't be that much of a big deal. Serious? 
can't be. Okay, Luke 1, we're going to take a look at verse number 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Wherefore shall I know that this, for I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years? And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel that stands in the presence of God, and am sent to speak to you and to show you these glad tidings. And behold, you shall be dumb and not be able to speak into the day that these things be performed, because you don't believe, you believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, this, I don't have enough time to go into the whole story, but basically, Zacharias and them, they were priests in the temple, and they had been uh, praying, believing for the promise of the Messiah to come, and, 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 and you know, and John the Baptist was in this, this whole story right here. And then all of a sudden, he gets an angelic visitation, basically told him that God, what he was believing for, God was about to bring it to pass. And then here he goes, oh, how can that be? How can that happen? And the angel said, because you don't believe, we're going to shut your mouth up. You're going to be dumb until this comes to pass. So the Lord uh, closed Zechariah's mouth. So, he, so that tells me right there that Zechariah could have hindered what God wanted to do. Why would God go through the trouble of closing a man's mouth up if it couldn't be relevant to bringing the promise of God to pass in this situation? It was relevant. So that tells me right there that, that listen, that, and listen, don't pray and then speak against your prayer. Line up your words with your prayer, with your promise, with what you believe in God for. If God was willing to shut a man's mouth because he was speaking contrary to the word, it is possible that Zechariah could have stopped the word of God from coming to pass. God knows how much power are in our words. The question is, do you know how much power are in your words? It is, and is it possible by the words we speak, and it is possible by the words we speak, we can assist or hinder what God wants to do in our lives? So my words actually uh, uh, assist or they begin to hinder what God wants to do in my life. Now, listen, I think the greatest thing that we have to battle with in, in, in keeping our, our words lined up with the word of God is we have to deal with natural circumstances that don't line up with the word of God. So we are accustomed to telling it how it is, calling it how we see it. This is what I see in the natural, and this is what I'm speaking, not knowing that that is the very thing that's keeping that situation from changing. Now, Proverbs 6, 2 says, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are snared with the words of your mouth. So listen, I can create a trap or a snare or something that holds me back where I'm trying to go forward, but it feels like something's holding me back because of my words that I'm speaking. Now, listen, don't worry about what other people are saying about your situation because in uh, Isaiah 54, 17, it says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn, you shall show it, prove it to be in the wrong. So you don't have to worry about somebody on the other side of town talking about you or downing you. That has no power in your life. God said that, that weapon... That that's trying to be formed will not prosper. Don't worry about I heard that. I'll deal with that. It won't even make it out the room that they're saying it in. But listen, the words that mess us up is the words that we're speaking. Yeah. We're snared by the words of our mouth. Now, I said this is one of the first revelations that God uh, began to give me. So I remember in that first time to begin to take an examination of my life. And begin to say, man, what words have I been speaking? And I began to realize that before anything happened in my life, I spoke it. I'm going over here. I'm going to do this. I'm doing this tonight. I'm about to get involved with this. I'm going over here. 
and I've realized that I have been speaking and actually not only speaking but walking out what I have been speaking over my life and speaking death. Oh, man, I feel like something bad is about to happen. Man, maybe I'm going to get robbed tonight or, or something's about to go. And I, I'm speaking these things in my own, and it's no wonder I feel like I'm getting surrounded because <laughs> I just spoke it, and now it's materialized. So God, because I'm a new Christian, God didn't have no reference point as a Christian. He had to take me into my life a darkness and show me how that law was operating in my life. So as a Christian, when he began to illuminate me, and this is a revelation for me, Bishop said, about going back to the foundations, this is a revelation that I got to rekindle every year. Because it's so easy to let the revelation slip back and you just start saying everything off the top of your head, how you feel about it. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're, 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 you're not cooperating with the kingdom of God. You're just saying anything that comes to your head. You're not, you're not filtering it through the word of God. You're just saying anything that comes to your mind and not realizing that you're speaking death back into your life. You're speaking death into situations that you want to see turned around. And so every year I got I to gotta refresh this and go and, and read scriptures like this and get this. So I have a, a, a good foundation in this area because that foundation can get shaky sometimes. Now go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I know every time I minister a word like this, the Holy Spirit is giving people total recall. And all these words that you've been saying is coming to your mind and be like, oh, my God. We you say, Wally, the devil is a lie. <laughs> okay, here we go. Verse 34, Matthew 12, listen to this. Actually, jump up to verse 33. It says, Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can you be evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of thereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words you shall be justified, and by thy words you shall be condemned. There's a lot in there <laughs> about the tree, the corrupt tree. And basically Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees because they had this uh, religious thing and they're quoting his word, but inside they were full of dead man's bones and said, you guys are evil. How can you guys be speaking good when it's not really coming out of your heart? So listen, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So listen, we're really, we're really not ready to begin to declare the word of God until we have that word in our heart in abundance. Because, listen, we don't want it just coming from our head. We want it coming out of the depths of our spirit, out of the depths of our inner man, out of the depths where faith resides, out of the depths where the power of God resides. We want those words coming out of our heart because those words are in our heart in abundance. Tell me something. How's it going to get in your heart? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to make sure that you put that word in your heart. David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So listen, it's up to us to get the word in our heart in abundance. Now, listen, we're going to have to be honest, brutally honest. I know for me, if I'm if I'm declaring something, I, I, I say, you know what, do I really believe this? And if I don't believe it, I'm just saying I'm going through a religious ritual. I got to step back and say, you know what? I need to get the word of God in that area, and I need to begin to meditate on it and put it in my heart and put it in my heart until I begin to believe 
the word of God. Do you know that as you begin to put the word of God in your heart, you will begin to believe that word? If you keep putting it in your heart, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't believe it. I don't have faith for it. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more I hear, the more faith comes in that area that I'm believing for. But I got to hear the word of God in that area for faith to come. If I don't hear the word, no faith can come. And that's why I don't believe it. So I got to go through the time and the discipline of getting that word in my heart, meditating on that word, and, and putting in that word. You know what? I might go over these scriptures a little bit in the morning time and then maybe in the afternoon and before I put my head to rest at night because this is the area that I'm believing God for and I'm not fully believing it, but I want to believe it. And I know the only way my believing is going to change if I get the word in my heart. But I got to be the one to make the faith deposit in my heart so I can and start believing the word of God. So as you begin to hear it, as you begin to hear the word of God, you begin to hear it. You begin to hear the word of God. The, the spirit inside you begins to rise up on the inside of you. And all of a sudden, listen, it's not just hearing. You begin to see an inner image of that thing that you're hearing. That word will begin to create a picture. How many people know that words create pictures. And listen, God's word is designed to create a picture of that very thing that you're believing for. But a lot of people don't stay with the meditation process of the word of God long enough to create that inner image of victory of success in their lives. And listen, they're, 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 they don't stay with it long enough. How many people know when a woman gets pregnant, it, it, that's just the first thing when, when, when inception happens. She's gotta, it's got to stay. It's got to be nurtured. It's got to be fed. It's got to be built up. you got to carry it for a while before it shows up on the outside. But you got to watch what you're eating. you got to watch what you're watching because you're trying to birth a healthy child. And after you carry it and you carry the word, listen, eventually... It's time to give birth. It's time. This baby got to come out. I'm not carrying this thing another month. It's time. Do, Lord, do some, what do they call that when they expedite a? Induce. <laughs> Induce me, Lord. <laughs> Push. Oh, come on, Pastor Vernon. Here we go. All right. Man, it's pretty easy, the inception part. Oh, yeah. Not fast, the fun part. Okay. Okay, <laughs> your children in the house. So then you're carrying it, you're getting everything ready, all prepared. But then when that day comes, whew, the pushing, the kicking, the sweat, the tears, the agony, not looking so pretty. Listen, but that's what it's going to take. To get this thing out. It's been pretty up to this point. But it's about to get ugly just for a moment. Keep going. Doctor got you. You're looking at. Whoa. whoa. My God. What happened? Over? But it's a part of the process. And listen, a lot of us, we, we, we are in a season of maybe birthing some, and you feel like it's been easy, but man, why all of a sudden it's getting so hard? Why all of a sudden it's gotten so tight? What is going on? You're in the delivery room. Why all of a sudden I've been functioning and carrying this thing for a while, and now I'm getting agitated. Now I'm ready for this thing to come forth. Now, now it's like it's got to happen now. What is that? It's time to birth it. I think one of the words that came forth was people have been believing for stuff, and it has not happened, and you're getting discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Keep on pushing. Keep on pushing. Keep on praying. You did hear from God. It's real. What's in your heart in a bunch will eventually seep out of your mouth. You can't stop it. Your mouth tells you what's in your heart. 
What's in your heart in abundance will come out of your mouth. And what's in your heart in abundance will come to pass. That's the dang, that's the that's the, the flip side of this. That listen, whatever's in my heart in abundance will come to pass. So we want to make sure that we have a good deposit in our heart. Now in Proverbs 4:23, it says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it comes the issues or the forces of life. So in your heart, the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. Don't put anything in your heart that you don't want to see come to pass. Don't be around a bunch of negativity, a bunch of people talking about what God can't do or God don't do that anymore. And that was for the Old Testament. That was the book of Acts. Get away from that because that is making a deposit into your heart. You need to be around the people that say, listen, we can do this. Listen, God can do this. God can do anything. Nothing's in the pot. That's what you believe in God for. Let's touch and agree. God is going to do this. You need something that's somebody that's going to agree with you. Not somebody saying, oh, it can't be done. It's not going to happen. Shut up. Shut the door. I don't want to hear that. Get out of here. It can be done. God is going to do it. So I got to guard my heart and make that sure I'm not. Listen, I don't care if you're at work and you're hearing a bunch of people talking, coming against the things of God. Just pick your lunch up and go to another part of the room or go in your car. You can't afford. Listen, you got too much on the line. You can't afford to, to listen, have a spiritual abortion. James chapter 3. You don't want to eat with us. You think you better than us? Uh, if you ain't following Jesus, yes, I am. I'm with the winning team. <laughs> Ooh, you want to see the devil's right? Ooh, you go in there with that. <laughs> Be bold is a lion, yes. Okay, James 3. Let's look at verse Number three, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. Man, a horse is a strong animal. And we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whatsoever the governor listens. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and set it on fire, the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and serpents of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed by mankind. But the tongue... Can no man tame, it is unruly, evil, and full of deadly poison. There would we bless God, even the Father, and there would we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things not ought to be. Now listen, you can tame the tongue with the Holy Spirit and with the word of God. God can put that, matter of fact, David prayed, God set a watch over my mouth, lest I say anything that's going to grieve your spirit. Anybody ever said something, you felt the Holy Spirit get grieved inside? I, I've done, I've, I've like, the words that came out inside, it's like, I'm like, oh, it felt like that small. Because those words, I said some contrary to the word of God, and the Holy Spirit's like, no, my son, my child, don't say that. So, this little tongue, and look at the comparison that the Bible makes. It's like the bridle that you put in a horse's mouth. Listen, 
A, a horse is a strong animal, but with a little bridle, a bit in the horse's mouth, you can pull it and that horse will obey you. And I like the word it uses. It says, and we turn about their whole body. Basically, the bit turns the whole body of the horse around and go this way and go that way. The bit in the mouth. You're not strong enough to control it, but the bit in the mouth gives you control over that strong animal. And then it says, behold also the ships, which they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about by a very small helm. Basically, the Bible is saying, don't be in so much awe over the size of a great ship. It's a little helm under that ship that is determining the direction of that ship, which is actually a greater miracle, not the size of the ship, but such a small thing can control the direction of the ship. And the Bible is telling us that your tongue is in that same category, that it's a small thing in your life, or you think it's small in your life, but it can control the very direction of your life of your marriage, of your finances, you can turn anything around with your mouth. Yes, yes. You know what? I've been speaking negative in this relationship, and you know what? I'm not speaking negative anymore. We watched a powerful video in the men's thing, and Edwin Lewis Cole said that, that God inhabits the praises of his people. So listen. God is going to inhabit, listen, when you speak things that exalt his word, he inhabits that. He goes and, listen, brings that. He moves in that and brings those things to pass. The spirit of God is able to move in the natural realm. So when you bless your marriage, you bless your children, you bless your, your relationships, you bless your finances, God can move in that and bring those things to pass. Things begin to move when you begin to change how you're speaking about those things. So listen, make a decision. You know what? I'm not going to speak negative about my marriage. I'm not going to speak negative about my wife. Listen, I'm not going to be calling sister so-and-so up talking about my husband. I'm going to bless my husband. I'm going to bless my wife, and I'm going to speak life because God inhabits the praises of his people. I got one for you. There's another form of language that somebody inhabits. The Bible actually warns us against it, murmuring and complaining. Matter of fact, it said in 1 Corinthians that I think 20,000 died in one day because of their murmurings. That the destroyer was, the door was open for the destroyer to come in and listen, destroy 20-something thousand people of the nation of Israel. It wasn't God. It was through murmuring the enemy got in that and was able to come in and invade their lives and bring destruction. So listen, who do you want inhabiting or moving in your life? I don't want the devil moving in my life through my murmuring and my complaint. I want the spirit of the living God, the presence of God to be inhabiting every area of my life. But I got to make sure that I'm, I'm praising God in those areas, that I'm blessing the Lord, and I'm not entering into a thing of murmuring and complaining because it's just going to perpetuate the very thing that I want to see changed. So the rudder of a ship begins to turn the ship. Also, it begins to change the ship's direction. In the turning, it appears that the ship is not gaining any ground. It seems like it's just going around almost in a circle. The captain knows that it's all a part of the process of changing the direction of the ship. Once the ship has changed its course, it will eventually be full speed ahead and eventually reach its destination. You know, sometimes when you're trying to turn your life around or you're trying to turn situation around, it seems like nothing's happening. It seems like you're going in a circle. But listen, keep doing it. Keep speaking it. Keep being positive. Keep doing good. Keep doing the right thing. God is just changing the direction of that thing. And listen, before you know it, you'll gain Listen, that destination, those right charter, those right coordinates, that right longitude, latitude, all that <laughs> stuff. Listen, and God will say, full speed ahead. Now we're on course to destination. But sometimes in the process, it seems like, it seems like I'm just spinning around in a circle. Nothing's happening. It is happening.
Now, let's go to, we're almost done. Let's go to Mark 11. Mark 11. In verse 22. Now, this is right after that story I shared with you guys a, a little earlier about Jesus cursing the fig tree. <laughs> and the disciples were amazed, like, wow. They were astonished, like, man. Matter of fact, let's just jump up to verse num number 20. And this is at the next day. And it says, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter called into remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you curses is withered away. Then Jesus had to give them the revelation. And Jesus answered and said to him, have Faith in God. Let me stop right there. What are you going to do about this situation? Have faith in God. Well, what are you going to do about uh, this that's going on? Have faith in God. What are you going to do about this? Have faith in God. Any response to life is have faith in God. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say, Unto this mountain. Jesus is showing them. He's teaching them. You know, Jesus was a teacher, right? He's, he taught. He said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Wherefore, I say unto you that whatsoever things you desire when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And I never want to leave this out. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father which in heaven may also forgive you. So none of this stuff works if you're walking around with something in your heart against somebody else. Get that right. And then let's start speaking the mountains. <laughs> Don't let situations speak to you. Jesus is telling us, do not let the situations speak to you. You need to start speaking to your situations. How many people know that situations have a voice? Listen, there's a voice. I don't hear your situation's voice. Nobody in the room hears your situation's voice, but you hear your situation's voice. Your situation has a, some type of mechanism that you only hear it. And it speaks to you day and night and night and day. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. Go to bed. It may be going in the morning. Still here. It's like, all right, enough of that. I'm tired of it. I ain't listening to you no more. You're out of here. And you start speaking against that, that thing and say, you be removed and cast into the sea. Your time is up. Your time is short. You're out of here. The word of God declares this and declare what the word of God says, and you are on your way out and start speaking to that thing that's been speaking to you. How many know the devil is 24-7? He's 20. He don't go to sleep either. He's 24-7, night and day and night and day and night and day. So if something is working against me that frequently, I got to do some type of resistance against it. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. What am I doing to resist this thing? Jesus had to do it in the wilderness. He had to resist the temptation with the word of God. He resisted. Then he came again. He resisted. Then he came again. He resisted. Then he came again. And he resisted. And he left for a season. So our life is a life of resisting these things that try to come against us. Okay, last scripture. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. The words. Romans chapter 4, let's take a look at verse number 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Somebody say, that's God's promise to Abraham. 
before him who believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham, God came to this man when his life did, it was the, almost like that should have been the last guy you chose to give this promise to. But that's the very guy that God wanted so when it happened, God could get the glory. But it says in verse 18, but it says, I'm sorry, in verse 17, God who quickeneth the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. So listen, as a Christian, as a child of God, you want to imitate your father? Call things that are not as though they are. God is in the business of looking at something and saying, do you, how many people know if God walked in here right now and said, Pastor Cecil, what day of the week is it? And God, you said Sunday and God said, no, it's Saturday. How many people know that I don't know how it would happen, but supernaturally, Numbers, maybe we've moved around. I don't back in time. I don't know, but some would happen where this would become Saturday. So he's in the business of looking at something that you think is it's Sunday, man. And God said, "Not if I don't call it Sunday. How I call it is how it's gonna be. It doesn't matter if you see it Sunday. It don't it don't matter if every calendar in the world has today marked as Sunday. If I as Saturday, it's about to change. So God is saying, my people, I've given you that same authority. I've given you that same power. So when you look at situations and they say that this is it, this is how it's going to be, and you go over here to your Bible, that's not what he said. So you know what? I'm going to declare what he said. I'm going to speak what he says. And I don't know what's got to happen. I don't know what's got to change. But listen, when it's all said and done, listen, I'm going to be giving. God's going to get some glory out of this. This thing is about to change. So listen, God is in the business of dealing with impossible situations. We are tempted to give in to the impossible situation by agreeing with it. Listen, and we agree with it when we don't speak the promise of God. We speak words that line up with the situation. And God is saying, don't say that. Call it. Listen, don't call it how it is. Call it how my word says it's supposed to be. And hold fast to that confession and do not let go. Make a decision, people, this morning. To speak life over your marriage, over your children, over your finances, over your ministry, over your job, over other Christians, over your church, over your pastors. Speak life. Be Listen, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth that it may minister grace to the hearers. Are your words ministering grace? Are your words ministering the favor of God? When I talk about somebody else, am I, talk, am I ministering grace or am I ministering murmuring and complaining? My words should be ministering the grace of God. Now, listen, sometimes we got to talk about situations and we got to talk about what's going on. And it may not sound like it, but we are, our, our, what we're believing for is it's going to turn around. Amen? Amen. I think we're going to stop right there. But before we stop, I want everyone to just stand to your feet. The Lord said to lead you in this uh, demonstration of just 
Because some people can hear this word, but then they'll leave and they'll, they'll not operate. So I want to just do a quick little training, this, this, this confession thing that I pulled down. And, and I want to lead you in it. And, 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 as, and as I declare it, just repeat it. Amen? Amen. Declare this. Father God, Father God thank, you for me thank you for making me righteous. And accepted through the blood of Jesus. Of Jesus. Because, of that, because of that, I'm blessed and highly favored by you. I am the object of your affection. Your favor surrounds me as a shield. And the first thing that people come into contact with is my favor shield. Thank you, Lord. I have favor with you and man today. All day long, people go out of their way to bless me and to help me. I have favor with everyone that I deal with today. Doors that were once closed are now open for me. I receive preferential treatment. I have special privileges. I'm God's favorite child. No good thing will the Lord withhold from me. Because of God's favor, my enemies cannot triumph over me. I have supernatural increase and promotion. I declare restoration. Of everything that the devil has stolen. I have honor in the midst of my adversaries and an increase of assets, especially in real estate and expansion of territory. Because I'm highly favored by God, I experience great victories, supernatural turnarounds, and miraculous breakthroughs in the midst of great impossibilities. I receive recognition, prominence and honor. Petitions are granted to me, even by ungodly authorities. Policies, rules, regulations, and laws are changed and reversed on my behalf. I win battles. I don't even have to fight because God fights them for me. This is the day, the set time, and the designated moment. For me to experience the free favors of God that profusely and lavishly abound on my behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mike Murdoch said that the atmosphere you create determines the product that you produce. And listen, when you begin to create an atmosphere, listen, like that with those words, especially among other believers, it begins to create an atmosphere that, listen, what you thought was impossible will be possible amen. when you change the atmosphere that you carry around you. Amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. 